Hello Year 12 and welcome to this video on George Orwell and his life. Uh, I'm attempting something different this time by creating a video that's going to be applicable to two different classes. On the one hand, this is designed for the IB students studying uh, Orwell's essays for their part two. You need to be able to anchor your discussion on the essay or this e extract from the essay that you have in his biography, but you don't need it extensively to refer to him as a person, but it's good in terms of, of looking at him <coughs> uh, and the way he's shaped his work. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying for this video to be relevant to HSC students studying 1984 in Module A uh, and relating that to Metropolis. Um, and you really need to focus on, on the historical, cultural, social and political context um, but it's interesting for you, I think, to see how Orwell reacted to what was going on around him, particularly when we come in towards the late 30s uh, and the first half of the 40s, where, <coughs> where 1984 was written. George Orwell remains a highly influential writer, uh, and I think what really makes him powerful is the fact that he saw through the shallowness and the hollowness of, of all the isms and the creeds um, that drive um, much of the thinking in our world. Um, and his work resonates with our, us still today because we encounter more and more counterparts to his creations in our 21st century context. Um, in this video, I'm essentially summarizing three different sources. Um, Christopher Hitchens uh, book Why Orwell Matters, uh, as well as the lecture that he, um, or it's not a lecture, it's an interview with him uh, at one of the business schools in America, which is can be found on iTunes U. Uh, and I'm also using Professor Michael Selden um, at Indiana State University. He, <coughs> excuse me, did um, a book called The World of George Orwell, where he essentially walks past, walks through his life as well. Uh, and so I'm using quite a lot of detail from from that text as well in terms of factual things. So Eric Arthur Blair, which is his real name, was born in India in 1903 because uh, his dad was um, working for the government over there in terms of the, the opium police uh, in the empire. Um, but his mother moved back with George to England when he was only one year old. Uh, his, so his <coughs> he's acknowledging in, in his essay Why I Write that his childhood dream was from a very early age, uh, perhaps five or six, to, to grow up to be a writer. And that uh, spirit is there already, if you go back and read why I write again. Uh, at seven years of age, he started St. Cyprian School uh, in Eastbourne in Sussex, um, and it was not a very pleasant experience for him. St. Cyprian's had quite a lot of issues with bullying uh, and um, Orwell really didn't enjoy that very much at all. Uh, but he did very well with the schooling, uh, so he was able to, by the end of his, his school career, to, in 1920, <coughs> no, sorry, 1921, uh, to gain scholarships um, first to Wellington and then into Eton College. But he never really felt, even though he, he wasn't bullied or, or sort of ostracised at Eton, he never really felt that he was... Um, fitted in with the upper-class students around him. So upon graduating in 1924, Orwell wanted to follow in his father's footsteps uh, and go out to India to pursue the imperial police uh, career. However, he was placed in Burma, which was a country that he never learned to enjoy or love. Uh, and it's partly because he, he, he hated what was going on in Burma in terms of the exchange between the 90 British policemen and 15,000 Burmese policemen that were trying to control a population of 13 million. Uh, and it was a country fraught with tension because um, of the, the reluctance or the, the resentment uh, of imperialism <coughs> down to the degree where even Buddhist monks were fighting for independence from the British. Uh, at the same time, the British had a great sense of superiority uh, amongst the Burmese, uh, 
uh, and, and was sort of putting them down. And you can see this if you read his his essays, A Hanging or Shooting an Elephant, you get that sense of British superiority coming through. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, Orwell contracted dengue fever in 1927, uh, and so after a long period of sickness, he was sent home to England to recuperate, uh, and at that point he decided he was never coming back to Burma, and he resigned from the Imperial Police, much to the dismay of his parents, particularly his father, who, who thought that was a bit of a letdown, since he had devoted his career to the police. Coming back to England, he uh, followed quite a, a number of different career paths. Um, uh, some of them voluntary, uh, almost as research, and some of them more forced because uh, of just um, limited funds. Um, but for at one stage, he chose to live in poverty. So he pretty much left uh, what uh, funds he had behind and went initially to Paris to work as a dishwasher in a hotel and then sort of lived through those the, the poor, the life of the poor, in, in Paris to get a sense of that, and then came back to England and went tramping and lived in spikes, um, which are sort of homeless shelters, just to get a sense of what it was like to be poor. Uh, and, and he writes extensively about this in his first book, Down and Out in Paris and London, which was published in 1933, uh, and really exposed those working conditions that people had to suffer through, or the lack of employment, really. Um, he then went off to work in the coal mines in northern England, just to be able to write the book The Road to Wigan Pier, which exposed the con conditions that the miners had to suffer through. Uh, in terms of other jobs, uh, later on, um, when he became a bit more stable, he got a job as a teacher. Uh, he worked for a while as a grocer, uh, and he took a job as a, as a bookshop assistant in Hampstead. Um, and, and he later on became a writer for the BBC, and eventually even a reporter for the BBC. <coughs> but that's a bit later on into the 40s. Um, it was quite interesting for, for Orwell in, in a sense, I think, that the work in bookshops, um, because it was kind of sobering, because he realised there was a great contrast between the idealist perceptions of a writer and why writers wanted to write, and the realist desires of, of the readers and what they actually wanted to buy. So with the publication of Orwell's first own book, Down and Out, in Paris and London, uh, in 1933, he adopted a new alias. Uh, he thought that, that uh, Eric Arthur Blair was just uh, artificial and foreign to the British public and didn't think that was going to sell any books. So he adopted the name, name George Orwell. Uh, he picked the name George because he felt it sounded solidly English, and we can understand that, I think, if we look at the fact that George V was the king, so you can't really get more English than the ruler. Uh, and, of course, the, the English sort of crest and the, the national saint is St. George, who slayed the dragon. Put those two together, you've got a very Englishy name in George. The name Orwell comes from a river, uh, which is in Suffolk, just northeast of London, uh, you can see that on this image from Google Maps. It's up here, so it's just outside London, but very much in the heart of the country. Another interesting thing that George Orwell learned during this period, uh, when working in the bookshop, um, was that titles in the M, N and O shelf uh, tended to have more circulation. So in, in the actual shop, those things were sold, more often, and in the back where they had sort of a lending library, uh, the books in the M and O shelves uh, tended to have greater circulation and be lent out more often, uh, partly because they tended to be the ones in the line of sight. Uh, so that, again, might have been a factor when he chose his alias in terms of actually having more exposure. In 1937, when the Civil War broke out in Spain, uh, Orwell, like many other great artists of his time, went off to fight for the Spanish um, the resistance uh, against the fascists. Um, and he fought for, the, there's a lot of fragmentation within that war, if you know your history, uh, and he fought for the party, the um, Liberation Party for Unification, uh, Marxist Unification. I'm not going to try the Spanish pronunciation um, because I won't succeed. <coughs> um, he was shot in the throat in battle in Spain, 
uh, and only narrowly escaped being arrested as he was um, ran away from Spain, uh, having recovered from those injuries. So in the 1940s, Orwell was working primarily for the, the BBC uh, and in the broadcasting service for the Eastern Services Department. Uh, and the main purpose of that agency, or that part of the BBC, was to generate support for Britain's war efforts outside in the colonies. So, so primarily for uh, India, um, Pakistan, etc., to, to broadcast there to make them support the efforts in World War II. Uh, and those broadcasts were monitored very closely by the newly founded uh, Ministry of Information. Uh, and we'll see, <coughs> obviously, that um, Ministry of Information coming through into, the, into 1984 as the Ministry of Truth. And uh, it's interesting as well that the Eastern Services Department of the BBC had all their meetings in room, or their uh, sense editorial meetings, in room 101, which obviously comes to play a big part in the last part of 1984. Orwell described the experience at the BBC um, as, as a bit feeling a bit like an orange that had been trodden on by a very dirty boot. So he clearly didn't enjoy this part of and obviously this is partly because he was already now uh, very much anti-imperialism and colonialism and the racism that was um, underpinning the oppression uh, in the colonies. It is very likely that the idea of, of Big Brother watching you uh, would have stemmed from this time period, that Orwell would have felt that he was under surveillance um, by the uh, Ministry of, of Information, uh, which indeed he was. Um, in 2005, some documents were released, released by the Scotland Yard, uh, revealing that Orwell very much was under surveillance as a suspected left-wing sympathiser back in the, uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. <clears throat> uh, it's also interesting that um, an article that Orwell wrote for a magazine uh, in America uh, and then posted off there had, had been opened and sections of it had been excised from... Uh, there was, the sections were about, were about the lynching of a potential um, crashed German airman in, in England. They'd been excised from the letter... Um, and Orwell was, was quite surprised and shocked by the fact that it was the censorship had been concealed. It was not just sort of blacked out, but they had actually gone to the effort of retyping the passage just to conceal the fact that it was censored. Uh, and he thought that was quite quite amazing. And obviously this, uh, again, echoes what goes on in the Ministry of Truth in 1984. It's interesting that the... Um, um, Professor Michael Selden, who's obviously made a life study of, of George Orwell, uh, suspects that Orwell, in fact, did this as a bit of a uh, bit of a trick to actually test the censorship system out and see how um, how effective it was and whether or not it was actually real. Um, I, I've got no way of, of verifying that statement, but it's interesting. In terms of the most famous books, and so in 1944. Um, uh, Orwell spent most of his time writing the novel Animal Farm and, and struggling to have, sorry, he wrote, probably wrote it in 1943, but in 1944 he, he went through extensive struggles to have the novel published because um, his publisher, uh, Victor Galang, was um, a great left-wing sympathiser and therefore obviously reluctant. Um, he was in fact a Marxist, so it was, it was very hard to get him to publicise anything that was uh, openly um, attacking uh, Stalin, particularly, uh, and so it, it took a long time to get uh, Animal Farm published. But once it was published, it was a great financial success straight away. It sold really well, both in Europe and in America, and then quite quickly in other countries as well in, in translation. A few years later, um, in, in 1948, uh, Orwell wrote the book 1984, and obviously the title came about by just uh, reversing those last two uh, numbers in the year that he wrote it. It was published in 1949, uh, and it came to be his final novel, uh, and in fact it was only published just before his passing. Uh, it pre presents a, a grim vision of a future society, and it's highly prophetic in the world that it's 
in the way that it's it's pretend presenting um, today's uh, sort of climate of fear society where we um, it's it's not easy to know what's what's true etc. Orwell has a very complicated relationship with left wing parties, uh, and that obviously partly stems from his his open criticism of um, Marxist totalitarianism. Uh, and he states in, in his essay, Why I Write, that everything he's written since 1936 has been directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. So he's, he's more right-wing than than the Stalinists, but he's nevertheless on the left in terms of where he stands politically. <coughs> um, he's often misquoted as, as having said that working class people smell. Um, and that's not quite, or that's not the accurate quote. What he said in the Road to Wigan Pier was that middle class people, such, such as his own immediate forebearers, were convinced that the working class smelled. So it's not about his own perceptions, it's what his parents' generation had been taught at school, essentially. The second thing that really led to a lot of criticism for Orwell, uh, and right up to to pretty much the turn of this century, uh, was a list, what's called Orwell's List. Um, and this presumably was a bit of a parlour game with a friend of his, uh, where they like to kind of have guessing games about famous people and what, uh, where they were positioned on various issues. Um, so he compiled a list of famous, um, what he thought were clearly left-wing sympathizers uh, and to an extent people who he thought were not trustworthy because they were so far down the the Stalinist flank and he the kind of almost holding out for them to to make some sort of coup and and take over uh, the country and so he kind of um, gave that list to Celia Kerwin who was uh, who worked for the information research department which was an anti-communist organization inside Great Britain uh, and his relationship with her was such that she was married to to a friend of his, uh, and on top of that, she was also a, um, a, a woman that Orwell had previously proposed marriage to, so he clearly had a soft spot for her. So it was, it was more done in that sort of uh, spirit and not as in an attempt to to actually catch anyone out. But nevertheless, it's become uh, an item often used to show that Orwell was a traitor uh, to the, the communist parties of England. If we have a bit of a look at Orwell in terms of his, his social family life, um, there's just a few things that you might want to be aware of. So he, he married Eileen O'Shaughnessy in 1936, uh, which was just before he went to... So she actually came with him to Spain, to Catalonia, and she was part of helping him home after he was injured. Um, in 1938, he came down with, with tuberculosis, um, and that led to an excessive period first in Marrakesh, um, where <coughs> uh, he was. they hoped for the heat to treat, to cure him, uh, and then later on he went to Jura, obviously, to write um, 1984 in peace. Um, he and and his wife... Eileen adopted a son, Richard, in 1944, uh, but only two years after that, uh, Eileen passed away. Uh, and he, towards the end of his life, he felt that he, his um, legacy and his, his ideas should be carried on. So he wanted someone to look after Richard, to look after his, the royalties that would keep coming for his books, and to, I guess, just take care of um, what he had accomplished. And so for that reason, he, he pretty much asked people to marry him just to become widows. Uh, and that, of course, is what, what happened, because uh, only uh, three months after he married Sonia Brownell, uh, Orwell passed away. <coughs> so in 1950, uh, at the age of 46, Orwell passed away from tuberculosis. Uh, and he rests today in Sutton Courtenay in Oxfordshire. Uh, and as you can see, we've uh, reclaimed his old name on his stone. Um, Orwell is fascinating. Uh, that despite being such a globally aware and highly political writer, 
caring about issues and traveling w- the world uh, with political and and uh, other social issues at in at heart. Um, he's still extremely tender about small things and natural things. Uh, we see that tenderness towards birds and beasts and flowers and trees come through in his work. Um, it's obvious in, in obviously in work essays like shooting an elephant, the, the tenderness towards the animal, um, the a hanging where we see we see a dog take a big part in the essay. Um, essays like thoughts on a common toad, where the inspiration of a toad uh, expands into so much more. But also in nineteen eighty four, uh, where we see this small piece of coral inside a paperweight become quite a significant issue. So there's a great tenderness in a man who's also so political and important in that sense.